Hello, listener, and welcome to this preview of our latest Patreon-exclusive episode. To continue the conversation and listen to the full episode, head over to the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon. The link is in the show notes. Hello, patrons, and welcome to this patron-exclusive episode of Beyond the Screenplay. Today, we are talking about Dazed and Confused, written and directed by Richard Linklater, the 1993 film. I am, of course, joined by the Beyond the Screenplay team, Trisha Rand. Hello, everyone. Brian Bittner. All right, all right, all right. All right. And Alex. (laughs) Hi. Excellent. Uh, Okay, so really quick business before we jump in. Uh, The next season of our podcast we will be announcing next month. So stay tuned. More on that to come. We haven't forgotten about you. Hope everyone's having a pleasant August and aren't having hurricanes and earthquakes in the same day. (laughs) We are okay. (laughs) It wasn't that bad in LA. (laughs) No, it was totally fine. It was just like... Like and I had slightly not sunny weather for like 24 hours and we all, we freaked, all out. freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> right. It would have been totally boring if they didn't like throw in the earthquake curveball. Uh, yeah. Like spice on top. Okay. So Dazed and Confused uh, won our back to school boat, high school movies. And I'd never seen this movie. I'd seen parts of it. I knew little things about it. Uh, but my, my link later filmography is pretty focused on the before trilogy uh so uh yeah i wasn't quite sure i mean i yeah i guess i generally knew what to expect but wasn't sure what i would make of it and the arc of this movie was it started kind of bumpy for me i was sort of in this like place of god being a teenager in this place in this time is hell on earth why did humanity even try to keep going if this is what existence <laughs> was? <laughs> if at any moment someone had walked in and been like, do you like this movie? I think I would have been like, I don't know that I do, random person. I don't know that I do. <laughs> Please get out of my house. <laughs> and then the credits rolled and I was like, I like that movie. It was a good movie. So there's something <laughs> magical and mysterious happening within the walls of this film that feels I guess link later and that like somehow the the sum of all these parts added up to something so much more than any given moment seemed to be for me. Um, so that was kind of my experience as a, as a newcomer and as a Michael uh, reacting to <laughs> Days of Confused. Yeah, I, I was very curious because I was thinking, I, I feel like a few months ago, I would have just been like, no, it's too like high school idiot like idiots running around you know throwing beer at each other kind of movie right and then i was like but there's like this link later kind of magic to it and then uh and then you know in the past few months we watched almost famous and the breakfast club and like michael you love breakfast club and i was like there's kind of a similar thing going on here where there's sort of no plot but it's just all about who these characters are and i was like i don't know i'm i'm hoping you'll have that that i would i was hoping you would have the experience you did right which is like starting out being like Good God, what is this? But then by the end being like, oh, they did they did all the things. So I'm happy to hear that you had that feeling in your gut at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Like to the point where I'm like kind of upset about it, where I'm like, I feel like I was tricked. And I'm like, right. wait, now I just I have to be one of the people that say I liked Days Confused. Like, ugh, OK, fine. Brian, tell me about Days Confused. Sure. Yeah, um, I appropriately enough, I saw this movie for the first time when I was probably about Mitch's age with. And I was with like my friends who were three years older and who were sort of like shepherding me into uh, into teenhood uh, from my, you know, wearing whatever my mom dressed me to school days. Um, (laughs) And uh, and yeah, I I liked it right away. But it was but it was sort of it was sort of like these little these little scenes my first time through. Right. It was like, oh, there's this line and there's this thing and there's whatever. But then watching it again whenever I watched it again over the next couple of years, then I started to actually like see the story, see the bigger picture of the movie. And then it just pretty quickly became a movie that I loved and and would watch all the time. But I I still have very, very fond memories. Like I remember exactly where I was when I was probably about 12 or 13 watching it for the first time. And the cool thing about this movie, um, and I think about all movies that are set in a certain place, time and place that are done well is I didn't at that age, I definitely didn't know anything about 
drug culture or sex or having people to hang out with even barely. Um, but like, I, I certainly didn't know anything about the seventies or high school or any of that kind of stuff or Austin. And I didn't feel alienated by any of that. Right. Mm. And I feel like this movie is not, this movie is not in any way trying to only be for people who were there in this specific place at this specific time. It just feels like this really universal movie and as Trisha said, I think in our Moonlight episode, you know, specificity breeds universality, right? Like the more specific you are sometimes to the story, the more that it can kind of feel like it is everybody's story in this in this weird but very cool way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very true of this movie. I agree. Uh, Alex, what about you? Tell me about Days and Confused. Yeah. I only seen it once before watching it for this podcast and I'm almost confident that our mutual friend Ryan McDuffie was the one that insisted I watch it probably while <laughs> nice. we were roommates living in Hollywood. Um, and I, I do have a memory watching it for the first time and just like kind of deep into the early, like hazing, you know, montages or whatnot, yeah. you know, just the paddles. And I was like, what, like, what is this movie? It's just going to be like this for like a long time. Um, and, and just kind of being a little bit irritated by like, I just wasn't, yeah, kind of like you, Michael, I wasn't really uh, nostalgic for whatever these days were. Um, and and so it was kind of, I wasn't really like loving marinating in that kind of first, you know, third of the movie. But once the night gets going, once everybody can get to their respective cars and like there's kind of a montage that, that kind of kicks off the night, then it kind of went into that link later zone where people are having conversations and it, you kind of just feel like time is just happening. Real time is passing. And I, and I got into it in that way, but it was kind of a mixed bag on my first viewing. I liked it a lot more this time rewatching it. And it felt even more kind of cohesive and coherent to me than the first viewing where by the end it did feel like there was this thematic you know, through line. And I just really enjoyed just, being with all these characters and and yeah, like marinating in this time and place uh, with all these actors. And there's so many actors in this yeah. movie that mm-hmm. went on to have these huge careers, and it's just really fun to get to just be with them and their their youth <laughs> and and just kind of hang out in this space with them. And there and there is some great, um, you know, I'm also in the Michael camp of the before trilogy is my link later, you know, thing. Like that's that's what I. You know, and also, you know, Waking Waking Life and some other specific films. But the before series is really what it's all about for me. Um, and and there are some moments in this that that hint at him going, you know, going into the boyhood and before trilogy places, you know, mm-hmm. conversations that are almost just kind of philosophical or just the way the way I was with my friends in high school. You know, you just talk about life sometimes and it's just nice that we have a director that's really good at making movies about those conversations and about people mm-hmm. having these conversations, which we do in life sometimes. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate it this time. And, and it's fun to see also early Linklater being a little more just creatively bold and there's a little more directorial style and panache coming through in this movie than, than the kind of more straightforward approach of the before movies or boyhood. Uh, there's just kind of a lot, there's a lot more kinetic energy and fun happening here with the editing and the music. And so I really also appreciated seeing that side of him as well. Yeah. 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 I think I do want to talk about, yeah, the, the style and the filmmaking. Cause I was feeling those things too, where it was like, Oh, the, I can see before, but also there's something different happening that does feel a little bit. Yeah. Separate from what I associate filmmaking wise with like later having only seen a sliver of his filmography. Trisha, what about you? Yeah, I've seen this movie quite a few times and I really, really like it. Um, I, you know, you've talked before, Michael, about how much you like parties in movies and like party scenes and sequences. Mm-hmm. And something about this being so contained on this one night and there's this like back to or like, you know, end of school year abandon of like the summer is ahead and like there's going to be a big party to kick off the summer. It has that driving toward this like party thing. And and in life, you know, you, we have these moments where like 
alchemy somehow magically happens sometimes around a party where like the right collection of like circumstances and personalities come together and you just realize like, man, I'm at a great party right now. Um, and it, this movie feels like that where, you know, enough things go wrong, but then like other events, stars align, come together. And then it has this climax, which is at a great party with all the characters that we know at that time. So I'm not surprised that you like this movie, but I'm really happy you like it, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and as someone who loves parties, I also love this movie. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's just this great, uh, you know, it's sort of a character study, but it's really this coming of age sort of story about Mitch in particular um, and Pink, I guess you are the two sort of through line characters that have those dual character arcs, the, the quarterback, Michael, right. <laughs> I yeah, I was, see him looking it up. Yeah, okay. Pink is okay. That guy. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. Jason London. Yeah. The guy who's to sign the, sign the yeah. waiver. Or whatever. Yeah. The guy who's supposed to say he's not going to party. <laughs> and Mitch is um, not Joseph Gordon Levitt. Correct. Yes. Little yeah. little baby freshman Mitch. Yeah. Yeah. Wiley Wiggins. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, but but with those characters, you know, you have sort of this uh, turning, uh, like pivotal moment kind of thing in their high school careers that the the party scene is driving, um, or the sort of party evening is driving. And so, I think you know, there's a lot that's actually really conventional in the structure. There's a lot that's unconventional and works really well. But as like an you know, one night contained sort of ensemble thing, it's probably one of the best out there and, or just like dollar for dollar, one of the most fun. Um, none of us lived through the seventies. So I think the nostalgia thing is not aimed at us, but I think we've all been through, you know, to your point, Brian, about the universality, we've all been through this time in our lives where suddenly like you're having the worst night of your life and then like the right girl smiles at you and you're just like, oh my God, I'm having the best night of my life. <laughs> like this is the most amazing night ever. Um, and I think that that's very relatable, that feeling of, I gotta hate that guy and, uh, but oh my God, I can't believe I'm at this amazing party with these people and all that stuff. So, um, what a fantastic movie. What a gift of a film. Thank you, Richard Linklater. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's, there's that like time thing also, because like when you're yeah. young and you're at one of those parties, it does feel like an entire lifetime plays out in the span of an evening. And so mm -hmm. getting to yeah luxuriate in all of that play by play in this movie is really great. Um, yeah. OK, cool. Well, yeah. So there's just like so want to talk about Linklater stuff just in general, how this sits in his filmography, stylistic things. Um the sense of time and place, I think, is really interesting. American Graffiti is another movie yeah. that came into my head. And so these kind of like up all night movies as a thing, I think would be really interesting to dive into. And then you guys will have to help me more because I'm still wrapping my head around the structure of this because it does just kind of flow and you get swept into it. But like, why do we care? Why do we keep watching? What are the dramatic questions that are there, even if they're hidden under all these layers that pull us deeper in or sort of all things that I think would be really interesting to dive into. Hope you enjoyed this preview clip. To continue the conversation and listen to the entire episode, head over to the Beyond the Screenplay Patreon. The link is in the show notes.